Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, State of the M&A Market in a Rising Interest Rate Environment. Please note that all attendees are muted and you are in chat-only mode, so as the discussion unfolds, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box. And now, it is my pleasure to hand things off to one of CEO Coaching International's premier partners and coaches, Randy Cook. Thank you, Nileen, and welcome to CEO Coaching International's webcast, State of the M&A Market in a Rising Interest Rate Environment. This is an exciting topic for me, as I've seen both life-changing events and also big disappointments in the M&A process. And judging by the large attendance of this webcast, there's obviously a significant interest in this topic and lots to unpack. Before I introduce my esteemed guest, Andy Harris, let me give you my introduction. I'm a partner and coach at CEO Coaching International. I spent 18 years as a CEO running both small, medium, and large-sized companies, ranging from big GE to small and privately held companies. Over the course of those 18 years, I've participated in 12 M&A transactions, both on the buy and the sell side. I'm super excited about this conversation for many reasons. But the most important one is, with my own experience, during my first M&A transaction, I was truly scared and clueless during the process, and I definitely had the imposter syndrome. And I really hope and I wish that I had some of the knowledge that Andy and I will be sharing today as some of you go through this process. Let me introduce Andy. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Andy Harris. He's one of the foremost experts in the M&A space. I have actually worked with Andy on four transactions myself, and I can personally attest that he is knowledgeable and knows how to help his clients exit and achieve extraordinary success. Andy is president of STF Capital Partners. Um, and one of the things I love about Andy's background is that he's actually been a CEO. So he's been there and done it both as an operator and as an investment banker and helping people exit. Within his career at uh, STS, he has helped over 30 M&A transactions, ranging from valuations of 20 million to up to 670 million, with a total valuation of $1.5 billion in exit. More importantly, and I think we'll dive into this later, is that Andy's been able to find additional value of 40 to 100% over the original financial buyer business case. And Andy will impact that later. Andy, welcome aboard. Hi, Randy. Hi, everyone. Uh, very pleased to be here. Before we jump into this, let me set the stage on what we'll be covering today. First of all, Andy will provide a state of the M&A in today's environment. We will then go into what's a general overview of the M&A process. And then we will directly address the following questions. What's the right time to sell? What's the difference between a strategic buyer and a financial buyer? What are some of the common mistakes that CEOs make? And what are some M&A best practices that every exec should consider? In the last 15 minutes, we'll do Q&A addressing some of your specific questions. Andy, let's jump right into this. Can you please start with what's the state of the M&A market today? Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> it's there's a big a big change has happened within the last uh, starting in the, the end of last year and, and into this year, and it really magnifies <clears throat> the difference be between um, a financial buyer and a strategic buyer. The big change has been interest rates and also the amount of credit that's available. I think we all know interest rates have have come up significantly, and the Fed just uh, increased rates again yesterday. Um, and just as an example of that, <clears throat> um, a year ago, uh, if you were taking on debt to help um, do an acquisition, and this would mainly be for, for financial buyers, uh, you would be able to get maybe up to six times the EBITDA of the business in leverage. You could get six times debt. Uh, today, that number is probably three to three and a half. So about half the amount of debt is available. And then also the interest rate on that debt has changed. Um, interest rates typically are um, the, the SOFR rate, S-O-F-R, 
rate plus probably five to 600 basis points. And right now that would put interest rates at around 11 to 12%. Whereas a year ago, it was you know four to 5%. So not only has the amount of credit available been halved, the interest rate on that, that debt is about double. So for that reason, especially for financial buyers, valuations are coming down just because they can't get the amount of debt that they would have normally had to make the acquisition. Um, strategic buyers who may not need debt to fund a deal or the cost of that debt is really insignificant, insignificant compared to the strategic value that's being created um, are not as impacted. So the difference between uh, financial buyers and strategic buyers in this market is, is pretty significant. Um, and uh, financial values are tending to come down, but strategic values, if that strategic value is there, still remains. Great, Andy. And hey, let's first start with giving a broad overview about the M&A process. You and I have been through many of these, and sometimes it can be quite intimidating. So can you just give like M&A 101, addressing some of the questions? What are the stages, i.e. deal prep, outreach, closing? Um, in general, how are valuations determined and how long does a typical process take? If you can just give an overall 101 there and then you okay. and I will dive deeper shortly. All right, great. And I'm, I'm gonna be uh, discussing this from, um, from a sell side approach. So if you're getting your business ready to sell um, and then selling the business. So typically I would also say this, it's, it's never too early to start preparing and thinking about that. And there's a lot of things that you can do early that then when you are ready to go to market, it's just gonna make the whole process that much simpler. Uh, and there's an extensive checklist. I won't get into those details now, but there are, there. Are, it's the main point there is, it's never too early, early to start thinking about it and design the business with an exit in mind. Even if you're not gonna exit, I think it's a best practice to do that. Um, <clears throat> a typical process uh, can take between six to nine months from the time you say, we're going to market. Um, and there's a couple different stages. There's prepping to go to market. There's pulling all your, all your information together that a buyer is going to wanna look at in due diligence and having that prepared. There's pulling <clears throat> together the marketing materials on, on the company. Um, and that would typically be a, a teaser, which is gonna just, it's a one or two page overview of the company. Um, on a no name basis, it's usually given a, um, a, a project name, Project Blue Sky, and here's the characteristics of the business. It's an enough for a buyer to maybe say, I, I'm, I'm interested, I'd like to learn more. Um, and then once you get that buyer to, to say, I'm interested, I'd like to get learn more, you get them under NDA, and then you give what's <clears throat> what would be called the, the confidential information memorandum, which is a comprehensive presentation or deck on the company. And, um, and that's enough to really give a buyer a really good feel for the business uh, and then start due diligence. Then you'd go into a due diligence process, get offers. Um, typically there's um, two rounds of offers. There's initial offers, and that's just to kind of get a feel for where, where the, the process is gonna be and, and, and who are the buyers you'd like to select to work with. Um, and narrow that down typically to a, a smaller subset of buyers from the, the best IOIs and the best buyer fits. And then they go into deeper due diligence, then you go into a, a, a get a letter of intent, LOI. And then and in that process, uh, typically it becomes very competitive. And that's when um, we like to see an auction run and, and a very competitive auction. And typically those offers move up there. Um, and then you get the final LOIs and you pick the buyer that you'd like to go with, with that LOI. Um, and, and then finalize due diligence with them. And that's typically, uh, and that's also negotiating the purchase agreement and then closing. So there's really kind of three stages. There's the prep, get ready, um, pull your marketing materials together. Then you go to market, you're in market, get up, get offers, competitive option, get those up to what, uh, uh, the best offer is and the best fit is and identify that, that, that best buyer and then close with them. So there, that's the kind of three stages of a process as, as we see it. Yeah, Andy, and as I think of it, and you and I are actually going uh, through a transaction with one of my clients right now. So going back to the stages, there's deal prep and there's outreach. So if you look at a funnel, right, 
you reach out to a large number, some strategic, some financial. And then over time, that comes into an indication of interest and then down to a LOI, yes. right? And then, so at the very end of that funnel, right, is where you start ideally getting multiple bidders involved. Question for you, when I first went through this, I was a little bit scared, wondering, do other entities know that I am going up for sale? Can you talk a little bit about that? If I'm about to sell my business, who knows that? Is it broadly known or is it somehow anonymous and how do you take care of that? Right. Well, yeah, confidentiality is a main concern of, of most buyers and actually, or I mean, of most sellers and actually buyers are concerned about it too. Uh, most buyers, they, they don't want to breach confidentiality because they don't want their, that reputation. And so in my experience, um, even in the absence of a confidentiality agreement, um, which we always go under ultimately, uh, in my experience, buyers are, uh, are not going to breach confidentiality. And then the only other way of who would know about it would be who would on the seller's team knows about it. And is it is it a close knit management team? Is it only the CEO and the CFO? Um, and and if as long as you can control it internally on the seller's camp, uh, the buyers, when they finally um, we all get them all under NDA. And in most processes, the company's name is not disclosed until the buyer is under a confidentiality agreement. Um, and uh, financial buyers, which would be private equity, uh, they they definitely can't breach confidentiality because if they ever had a reputation that they, they can't keep their, um, they can't keep confident, con information confidential, then their 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 reputation would, would be um, scarred and who'd want to ever deal, do a deal with them? Because um, that's what they do is they do deals. Strategic buyers, likewise, especially if they're public company, they can't disclose it because they're public. Um, if they're not public uh, and they're doing a deal, they usually really want to keep it quiet for competitive reasons or for whatever other reasons. So <clears throat> in my experience, confidentiality um, usually is is um, is maintained and, and everyone takes it very seriously. Andy, then sticking with the process we just went over, one of the major questions that I had when I went through this with my companies, as well as I'm, I'm sure some of the audience is, how do I determine how much my company is truly worth? So can you give a little bit of background on how are valuations determined? And is it industry based? Is it multiples of revenue or EBITDA? Can you give an overview on that, please? Well, there's a couple of ways of doing it. First of all, you can go out to a, a company that does valuations. And in most cases, those are done for tax planning reasons and for estate planning reasons. And in those cases, you want a low valuation because you want your basis to, to be to be low that you've put in into uh, your estate or, or your trust for tax planning reasons. So that's a different type of valuation versus an M&A process valuation. And an M&A process valuation, that, that value is really set by by market, what the market will speak. And that's really where there, there's the differences between a financial buyer valuation and those valuations usually are, I mean, it, it all goes back to a model of discounted cash flow and, and all of that, but typically it all boils down to, to multiples, right? And it's either a multiple of EBITDA or a multiple of revenue. And it, that's gonna vary by industry because by industry margins are vary, right? Um, and then also by the characteristic of, of that company's, um, their business, their revenue. Is it project-based where they're always having to hunt for their next customer and their next, um, their next revenue, their next contract, their next, um, their next deal? Or is it recurring-based? And if you have a business that has contracted monthly, month over month over month, revenue subscription based and your high margins obviously you know it's kind of like a cash uh, printing cash machine at high margins that business is going to get much higher multiples of revenue and multiples of EBITDA versus a um, let's say a brick and mortar uh, more manufacturing business where you're man you, you're manufacturing something and you sell it kind of one time and then you've got to go out and find another customer to buy by it and, and you, you may have thousands of customers, but they're all they all tend to be one-time sales or maybe a couple-time sales 
or even if you're manufacturing that some somebody's buying from you all the time let's say it's it's chemicals but the margins on those chemicals can go up and down so there's supply chain risk and you may have customers that continually are buying from you, but their volumes may change, may fluctuate, their demands may fluctuate. That That's not really seen as contracted recurring subscription type revenue. So th that type of a business is going to get a lower multiple um, versus uh, the, the recurring revenue business. And, and as an example of that, um, you know, I think in, there's a there's a service that that we subscribe to and in, in many. Um, investment professional subscribe to called PitchBook. And PitchBook monitors all deals across the world. Um, and I, I just looked at a refresh on the data recently. Take a, an IT software company that has a subscription-based SaaS model, uh, software um, or license type model. And those, those mul multiples can be two and a half to maybe three or four times revenue, uh, 12 times uh, above on EBITDA, that versus a materials-based kind of manufacturing company, those multiples now, uh, they were at maybe 10-ish 10, 10 uh, a year or so ago, they now come down into the seven or eight range on, on EBITDA and maybe one to one and a half times revenue. So that just helps to, to give a contrast between those two different types of, of businesses and also those, those industries. And then the final function is also, um, I think, just simply supply and demand. Is there an industry that there's a lot of buyers going after or one where it may not have as many buyers going after it? And then it's, 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 then it's a matter of competition. And obviously, the more buyers, uh, the more competitive the process would be and typically the higher the values would be. Yeah. And then as it relates to the, let's unpack that a little bit more, Andy. And you and I have done quite a few of these together. But one thing I want the audience to know is when you engage with a client to help them exit on the sell side, you will know, they'll have your expertise to say, listen, you're in the software business. You might be at 15 to 20 uh, X EBITDA. Or if you're on the contract manufacturing side, you might be in the five to seven range. You'll be able to guide them on what that starts like, but yes. then, which is great. It's great to have those benchmarks, but then explain a little bit more about the financial buyout versus the strategic buyer as you go through that process. Right. Well, typically the market values that are that are discussed are financial market values. So six to eight times EBITDA or 10 to 12 times EBITDA, that's what a financial buyer and what the, the typical market value in a, in a given industry would be as an example. Then there's what's also called strategic value. And strategic value is financial value plus other value that's being created by the combination. And that strategic value can be significant. And I'm not just talking typical synergies where it's like, oh, we're combining two businesses. We don't need two CEOs. We don't need two CFOs. We're, we're saving some costs there. The strategic value is where, um, let's say, one of the companies has technology that the other one desperately needs. So it's going to transform that one if they were to have the access to that technology. And then let's say the, the other t company that needs the technology has some market access or customer access that the one that has the technology doesn't yet have. So now you can say, all right, both companies can be transformed by this combination. And it's really a growth. Um, uh, strategic value right uh, and maybe some cost strategic value as well but when you when one plus one equals four or five that strategic value is well above the traditional financial market value and and so what what we have done and you mentioned it earlier randy was that um that strategic premium can be <clears throat> 30 40 50 100 percent over over market value so Someone might say, wow, I, if I could get six to eight times EBITDA for my business, I'd be, I'd be thrilled. You go out to market. That's what typical private equity and financial buyers and even the strategics are going to come in at because they know what market value is. But then as you run that process and you work the model and, and you work that model for the strategic buyers and what could this really become? What is the integrated strategic value? 
And you might find out, wow, they, this is worth twice that to the buyer, right? If when we come together, magic happens, um, and the buyer, they'll, they'll never tell you this, but they're willing to pay twice that. And as you run the process in the right way, you can end up getting twice that. And guess what? In that case, the strategic buyer doesn't doesn't walk away saying, wow, we just we just got taken advantage of. They're still thrilled because it was worth that to them. And the seller's thrilled because they got twice the value. And in many times you can find um, a great home, right? Where um, a lot of, there's a fallacy, I think many times that people think if I sell to a strategic, they're gonna decimate my company and decimate my team. And, and that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes the strategic, and, and in the if that's in a really great situation, you find the strategic that desperately needs your company and needs your people, and because it's something that they don't have or they're not. Um, and when you can find that, that's also when you get maximum value, and you also get the other outcomes that your team's going found a great home uh, and is going to be well taken care of, and there's a just this really great strategic fit, kind of a match made in heaven. So, Wendy, let's take what you just said and let's you and I apply it to a transaction that you and I participated in just to give everyone audience about how these real numbers work and the difference between a financial and strategic buyer. So when you and I went out on this process and Rob's going to keep it anonymous, right? We had large interest. We had a number of financial and strategic buyers come in. We got it down to three total. And just to share with everyone, this was an industry uh, that had a 5X multiple of EBITDA. That was the normal range we were at. And so we had a LOI on the table, and let's use the numbers of, let's say they were doing 10 million in EBITDA. So they had an LOI on the table for the financial buyer, i.e. private equity, of $50 million. In our case, you were able to find a couple strategics out there and we actually got 7x the multiple because of the strategic nature of that. So the ability to move it from a financial to a strategic buyer netted our client an extra $20 million. Can you add a little bit more color to that example as it relates to the strategic and financial buyer? Yeah, sure. So first of all, um, it's, it's identifying the buyer universe to begin with, right? And so... Um, <clears throat> We uh, we identify the outreach list that we're going to reach out to, and in this case, we knew the the private equity firms that were very interested in this space had either had companies in the space or had done deals in the space in the past, and then we identified strategics that were in the space, and then we also look at what are adjacencies, <clears throat> are there other markets or other industries that would love to get into this space because there's some strategic combination that makes a lot of sense so and then that's how we identify this list of maybe 100 or 200 and sometimes maybe as many as 300 companies that we would outreach to right and so you you, you broaden your strategic base but it's not just throwing it against the wall and seeing what sticks not sending it out to thousands right it's it's a very targeted um maybe a couple hundred most of which we think have strategic uh, opportunity here um, and then, and that's all on a no name basis. Once again, it's once again, it's project blue sky. You, you send out the initial um, blurb on the company. People say they're interested. They come back, we get them under NDA. And then we go through this process to ultimately get initial offers. Those initial offers are used by the, the seller to say, all right, all right, here, here's the people I can tell are very interested. First and foremost, what do I think of them as a company? Do I think they'd be a good home? What's their valuation? What's the terms of their deal? And that's another very important point here. Um, some deals come in all cash. Obviously, in many cases, that's that's wonderful. Uh, private equity typically is going to come in all cash plus some amount of seller rollover where the seller stays in the, the deal moving forward. And typically that can range from 10 to 20. It's, typically, it's 20 to 40 percent, but it can maybe sometimes go lower than that. And sometimes not at all, um, <clears throat> but that way the seller gets to stay in the deal and get quote unquote a second bite of the op of, of the apple, such that when private equity ultimately um, sells the company down the road, the the seller participates in that and gets some value from that again. So that's the second bite of the apple. So that's something to do with deal structure. And then the third component of deal structure sometimes would be an earnout, right? Where 
we're going to give you a hundred million dollars, but you're getting 50 million today. We're asking you to roll over 30 million or, and, and then there's another 20 million that you'll get down the road or next at the end of next year or two years, if the company performs to a certain level. So that would be a, an, an earn out. But deal structure is also one other thing you want to you want to identify in the initial offers to find out who's who's got the cleaner deal structures or the deal structure that works best for you. Then um, you, you take the decisions from these IOIs. Who are the buyers that you want to move forward with? And you know, hopefully it's a handful or, or 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 more, a little bit more, not too many, but ones that you think will be most competitive. And and work with them to identify that strategic value. What's the real combination here? You're falling in love with them. They're falling in love with you. And it's, wow, this could be a really, really great combination and great fit. And, and they're doing deeper due diligence. And then ultimately you get LOI, letter of intent from them, which could be binding. And through that letter of intent, that's the one, in, a, in our case with the seller, we narrowed it down to the final three here that had the most interesting and best LOIs. And, um, and we found one that was a really, really great fit. The seller met the buyer. Uh, there was some personal connection there. The strategic connection for how the businesses fit together really complemented each other. And um, the, the seller's business was something that the, just fit like a glove into the, the buyer's business. And it, it, it complemented regionally and, and also their set of customers and what they did. And there was some real strategic value created there. And also ultimately where this um, strategic buyer wants to go with the business was very, very attractive to the seller as well. Um, and in this case, the seller wanted to stay on with the business, just didn't want to be present in the CEO anymore. And the buyer says, oh, we've got a great fit for you in a different role. That, that, and you don't have to be present in CEO. So everybody's getting personal outcomes met, strategic outcomes met, and, and really a nice strategic value outcome being met here. And, and it, it just works for everyone. But it takes some time to get through that, working both with the mainly with the buyers to to assess and help them assess the strategic fit with uh, with the seller. Yeah, Andy. And let's do this. Let's pivot a little bit back in the process and let's think of this from the perspective of how is the CEO or founder or exec feeling? Um, before I give you the specific question, I wanted to remind the audience. If you have any questions, the last 15 minutes, we will do a dedicated Q&A, but don't wait to the end. Feel free to type your questions into the chat. We'll have a large list of them, but I wanted to make sure you knew that was available to you, and don't wait to the end. Please go ahead and throw those questions to the chat right now. Hey, Andy, hey Randy, real quick, before we jump, jump into your question about how the seller is feeling, one thing, I, it just crossed my mind, um, on that deal we, that you were talking about, kind of we is, is um, similar values the five to the seven in this case i do want to make the point initial offers all came in in the five-ish range as we went through that process we moved up to the seven range the strategic value so the strategic buyer came in at what was market even though they knew it was worth more to them right strategic buyers are not they're smart they're, they're not going to come in with their best offer <laughs> Uh, right away. And sometimes they don't even know what that best offer is until they go through that process and then they find, wow, this really is worth more to us and and we'll guide them there and it's a competitive process and get them there. So um, there's a lot of processes that get run that market values come in and they just pick the, the best buyer that they like the most and take a market value. And it is worth the extra time. It can take maybe a month or two to go through that competitive process to, to really get that strategic value identified and then achieved. Yeah, no, excellent. Um, so, hey, let's pivot to the founder, CEO, or exec that's selling the business. When I went through this, and many of my clients go through this, there's a very natural human question of, what the hell is gonna happen to me? Do I, A, get to stay on as the CEO? Do I get golden handcuffs? Do I wanna stay on? Um, Am I gonna be on the board? Give us a perspective of how the CEO or founder should be thinking of that, and what are some of the sort of categories that you've seen within those buckets? 
That's a great question. And, and in my opinion, it's one of the most important questions, right? If not the most important question. And it's, first of all, identify what is driving the exit? Is selling all of the 100% of the company or a majority or a minority? What's driving that? And really doing a self introspection and, and, and a deep dive exercise to understand what's driving it. Once We've identified that, and, and we do that with the, with, with the client and working with you as a coach. We did that with our client that we're working with right now. We had to really understand what was driving his exit, right? And then what is required and what is preferred? So what is must-have out of, out of the transaction and what is nice to have out of the transaction? And, in, and you know, an example of must-have, in this case, the one we had, that um, there was a, a minimum transaction value that he must have, right? He, he's like, if I don't get that value, I'm not gonna do the deal. And it was a reasonable value. He wasn't, you know, um, out, of the, out of the ballpark thinking. Um, but the, And then his preferred was, I'd like to stay on. I don't have to stay on. I do know I don't wanna be president and CEO. That was a must have. If I'm gonna stay on, I don't wanna be president and CEO anymore. I don't wanna be running the business. But I'd like to stay on. I'd like to be involved. And then the other thing was he wanted, he absolutely had to make sure that the buyer was going to keep his locations and his people. And he wanted to find a situation where there were more opportunities for them. He has been in this business for over, you know, I think it was 25 years. The employees that got him where he was today, he felt very just grateful to. And he wanted to make sure that they were well taken care of and it was a great home for them. So. It's it's really important to identify what's driving the exit, what are the must-haves, and what are the nice-to-haves, and then continually go back to those as you go through the process. Because once you get offers that come in, they're like shiny objects, and you're like, oh, this one. And but then once you really go back to, well, remember this is what we said you must have. This is what be nice to have. This one's not meeting that. It it helps that decision process move uh, moving forward uh, to keep that. Uh, just keep the, the seller moving forward in, a, in, in what grounded to what they originally sought to achieve. Um, and then I think the other thing that's nice to do is think, think about what would an ideal exit look like, right? Let's, let's say what would ideal look like? And that's really what we're going to shoot for. Not always get it, but if you, if you balance that with this must have, nice to have, and what was driving it all along, um, it, it tends to um, it's a very intentional process then. And Eddie, let's stay there talking about the founder and CEO for a bit. One of the major questions that we get is, when is the right time to think about selling? Is it a revenue number? Is it a certain maturity of the business? And when do I engage with some help on that process? What's your recommendation yeah. on those questions? Well, I, I think once again, it's never too early to start thinking about it, right? So engaging with a, 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 co a coaching organization like CEO Coaching, that can help that, that planning process early. Maybe it's three to five to seven years out, a long time out, but but that can help. And, and surely a coaching organization knows a lot of the boxes that need to be checked so that when we're starting to really get close to an exit or thinking about an exit, we've already got systems and things in place that are going to help facilitate that. Um, but ideally, I think, you know, if um, I've got clients that come to me right now and say, I want to exit next year. All right. That's not too late. It's fine. We can pull it together. But many times there's a few things that will say, well, wow, you know, but if you did this, this, and this, it's really going to improve your valuation and chances of a really great process. Sometimes those things can be done within a matter of, you know, a few months. Sometimes it might take a little longer. Um, but ideally, I think, uh, start early maybe two years in advance to, to, to at least start engaging with with um, a sell side invet advisor an investment banker to get some thoughts um, many times people have a number in their mind right if i could get 50 million for my business or 150 million for my business that's i'm out right that's perfect for me so they have to do a, a check and we would check market to, and look at valuations and say yeah that's realistic yeah you we think you could get 50 million plus above that because of the strategic value so we feel very confident with that or we might say wow 50 million 
you know, that's a real stretch. That's only if we find the outlier strategic and you're more likely to probably be 30 to 40 million in that case, right? So, and then the owner may say, okay, well then I'm, I'm not ready to go. I've got to grow the business for a couple more years because I, I want that $50 million number, right? So sometimes it's a number that people are shooting for. Other times it's just, I'll take whatever market will give me, right? Let the market speak, try to get me that strategic value. It's just time, right? It's time for me to exit the business. Um, I want to take chips off the table now. Um, I want to start giving back while I, and enjoying the fruits of my labor while I'm still healthy. Um, I'm in my go years. Uh, or maybe something's happened where someone, you know, had had some event occur in their life that has just said, I have to sell. It's, you know, there's been a death. There's some something that's occurred where the where the, the seller has to sell. Right. I'm just forced to sell right now. And then it's still in that case. Hopefully, let's not make it a fire sell. Let's run a really great process and get the maximum valuation. So there's a couple different things to consider about when you start, but it, ideally I'd say if you can start at least a two years in advance, um, if not a, a year in advance, and most processes take six to nine months. So you're gonna need to start probably worst case, minimum case a year in advance. Yeah, and, and, and as an example, I introduced you to a, one of my clients and we talked through it with them, and what we figured out was we were growing at a good clip, right? And what we figured out in that case that we had to keep growing the company, and we targeted 50 million at about a 12% EBITDA, and that was sort of the sweet spot, which was two years from now. So that's the strategy we're on, and that's when we're gonna re-engage with you to actually start the process. Um, so let's stay there for a second. I've made the decision, I want to go forward. I'm the CEO. What two questions on on team? What external team do I need? I.e., get an investment banker involved. I.e., maybe get yep. someone to come to a quality of earnings. And, and what do I do internally? Do I tell some of my key people? Do I keep that um, a secret? What is your advice on that question? About once I've made the decision, what's the team I need going forward? Okay. Yeah, there's two 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 components there. First of all, external team. Um, uh, I abs I absolutely advocate that it's kind of negotiation 101. If 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 you're gonna if you're gonna sell your company, um, hire a sell side advisor. They will pay for themselves in in many times over, right? Uh, because the value that, that can be created and actually simplifying your life too. Um, so th their fees normally more than pay for themselves. Also hire, make sure your, your estate plan, your tax plan, your trust is all set up. And there's things that you can do that when you sell your business for 50 million or 100 million, most all of that is going into um, vehicles that avoid tax and, or they, they defer the tax down the road, right? So that's the most, it's how much money do you keep, right? And so get the advisors, that help you to do that. And that's normally a, a wealth advisor, right? And I would go with a full service wealth advisor, right? Somebody that has all of that, not just here's where, we, where you invest your money. We're going to manage your investment for you. Um, and then I would say also a coaching organization. I think that, you know, you know something like CEO coaching or, or any, any, a coach that can help kind of coach you to get prepared for exit, especially if it's several years in advance get some of that input. So that's the external team that I would strongly recommend um, people surround themselves with. Um, yeah, so I, I think that answers that that question. And then the other, what was the other one that you had asked on that? Um, no, you nailed it. Um, it was about the team. It was, what's the oh, team? I oh, need and when do you involve the internal team? Right. So, and that to me is all a, 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 a it's, it's up to the, the CEO and founder, right? If you like to keep things really close to the chest, maybe it's just you and your CFO and you run the whole process that way. Um, there's some others that may say, you know what, I, I want, and who can, who, who can you really trust to come into the trusted circle? And maybe you may say, you know what, I'm gonna involve my CFO, my head of sales and my head of operations. And I've been with them for a long time. And I'm going to actually even give them a nice little piece of the deal when it closes. So they're, they're motivated to stay with me and they're excited to help make this happen. Um, so it, it's, it's individual case. 
Um, and I've even see, seen times where somebody tells right up, they just feel like it's the matter of their culture, their company, they tell the whole company, right? We're, we're preparing for exit and, and we're gonna get everybody a great outcome. It, it just depends. That's pretty rare that you see that happen, but um, more often than not, it's, it's CEO, CFO, and then maybe a couple other very trusted and people that add value to the process that when you're in process, the buyer's gonna wanna speak to, right? And that gives the buyer great confidence that wow, there's a management team that, that's running this business that is doing a really great job of it. And I'm getting a quality business and a quality team. Andy, as you reflect back on your 30 years of doing this, what are some of the biggest mistakes? What's what are some of the biggest mistakes that or misconceptions? that a CEO or a founder has about the whole process? Yeah, um, it's funny, I, I kind of anticipated you'd ask this question, so I wrote a few ideas down, uh, and there's a really long, long list, but I would say, um, you know, how much work it takes to sell your business, it's a lot of work. And most all of the sellers that we've worked for, once the deal closed, they look back and they're just like, I, I had no idea how much work that was going to take, right? So I, it, it does take a lot of work. Um, I think that, um, that and, and for that reason, and it may sound self-serving, but I, an, a, a sell-side invest, uh, advisor and investment banker can really help simplify and streamline that amount of work and then also get value that more of them pays for themselves. So I, I think, um, that 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 is i don't know if it's a mess, misconception but i think it's it's really something that will will add a lot of value and just make everybody's lives simpler to get through the process um and then the other thing i think is that there's a misconception many times that i need a specialist you know i i'm in this in industry a and i need um, i've decided i want to have an investment banker or sell side advisor but i need somebody that's in that space that does deals in my space. And without a doubt, they're a specialist. They all get a deal done. They know the buyers in the space. Um, but what, in my, my experience, what they'll do is they'll get the deal done at market value or maybe a little bit over market value, but they're a little bit conflicted because they do know the buyers in the space. It's gonna be really hard for them to push those buyers to some other greater strategic value because they know them and they've actually maybe even become friends with them. Um, and it's just harder for them to do that. So I think that uh, an industry specialist can be conflicted and not 100% acting on behalf of the seller, or if they are working on behalf of the seller, they're typically gonna only get the industry market value because they're the ones that helped to set those market values over the years because they've been the specialist in the, in the industry. So I, um, in my experience, that's a bit of a fallacy and there's industry agnostic firms out there that aren't specialists that, that can look at it with eyes wide open, um, look at adjacencies, not just people in the space, but look at adjacencies and, and many times get these outlier strategic values or outlier strategic valuations that an industry specialist might not be able to get because they're kind of conflicted with their relationships in, in, in the space. Yeah, and, and I do want to double down on what you said about um, getting an advisor or, or um, investment banker involved. To be honest with you, in my early days, I was a little anti-investment banker or advisor. Um, but I got to say, um, without a doubt, every time I've done it, every time, 100% of the times I've done it, I've had more success and a higher number by working with advisors. And I'll just give an example to the one I gave to the team. Um, we talked about the one where we had an offer of 50 million and then 70 million from the strategic. We actually went out before that. My client went out before that without an advisor, and the highest he could get on his own was 38 million. So just the delta there by getting an advisor on board paid for itself many times over. Yeah, I want to remind the audience here. Yeah. Please go into the chat add questions we've got a number of them coming in right now i'm about to address some specific ones andy before i give you one final question and go to the q a did you want to follow up on what i just said 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to come across as I'm just trying to sell and you've got to have an investment banker. I have, I have friends that sold their businesses without an investment banker, right? And they had a good result. I, I just believe that in that, in most all those cases, um, it, it, there's probably significant value that was less left on the table. But you just don't, you don't know any other, any, any otherwise. You don't need better. But if you're a good CFO, there's a lot. All of us could could sell a business very likely on our own. Um, I've seen many times the deals don't a actually end up happening, or if they do, you just don't know how much money was left on the table. So. Um, yep. Andy, before we go into the specific uh, questions coming from the audience here, we've covered a lot today. If you had to give the audience three concise takeaways from today's conversation, what would those three be? Um, you know, it's never too early to start preparing. Um, surround yourself with a really good external team to get prepared for exit um, go through a checklist of what are the things that are really going to create the most value um, and working with a, a coach or an investment banker to, to do that for each individual business and then um, i would say run a competitive process because you can really maximize value by doing that um, and even if you have a one-off offer let's say you've got it in a, a buyer today that says send me some financials, we'll give you an LOI, we're ready to go. And you think that's the perfect buyer. Still run a process with that buyer. I call it a preemptive pro process, but where they they have to compete and put their best foot forward and sharpen their pencil in order to win the, that opportunity um, to do this preemptive. And if they they don't get there, then you're prepared to run a process, even if it's a narrow process, but it's a way of maximizing value. So I think those would be the three three main things. Okay. Start early, surround yourself with the right people and, and run a competitive process. Got it. Hey, Andy, questions coming in from the webcast here. The first is, if I know the industry multiple of what a financial buyer would pay, some of that's public information, how do I know what the strategic value might be? Out of the gate, you don't. And it's going to vary based on each individual strategic buyer. And it depends on what, you know, what do you bring to the strategic buyer that they need? And what do they have that you need? And and will transform both businesses. And when you can find those buyers where there is transformation occurring on both businesses, that's maximum strategic value. Or maybe it's just there's a strategic buyer that if they bought your business, they could double it or triple it, right? It's, you're not going to impact them a whole lot, but just who they are and what they can do, they could double or triple your business and it and it's just or or maybe vice versa, right? So but you don't know that until you identify those buyers and until you get into the strategic model with each individual with each each individual buyer. Perfect. Andy, next question. Um, and you might need to define it first, but a question from the audience was the whole idea of a SIM, which goes out early in the process. Mm -hmm. If I'm thinking of a, a strategic buyer, do I need to create a a different custom SIM? for each strategic buyer. So can you first define what a SIM is and then go ahead and address that question? Okay, Com SIM is Confidential Information Memorandum. It's a, it's a deck or a presentation on the company and it goes through basically everything on the company, right? It's gonna talk about your supply chain, your customers, on a, usually on a no-name basis, you would redact customer names. Um, you may give representative customer names. Let's say you have some blue chip customers. You may say, we're doing business with AT&T or Pricewaterhouse or IBM or whoever. You may say that, but you're not going to identify exactly what the, the business you're doing with them. So you can you can redact and keep it um, redacted. Same with suppliers, um, your technology, your employees, your culture. It basically describes the company in every single bucket you can think of. And it gives enough detail that typically somebody studying the SIM and doing a little bit of due diligence is educated enough to be able to give an offer for the company. 
an initial offer. Now back to the question, do we customize it to the strategic buyer? And the answer is yes, because there is a model and 95% of the SIM is gonna be the same. There may be information in the SIM that you don't want a strategic buyer to have because it's so your competitor, or if they, if they, you may keep some stuff out for some strategic buyers and say, we're gonna give you that information down the road because it's, it's so sensitive. Um, or, and then the other in place where you would um, customize it is building out your growth model, right? If we were to fit with you, here's what our growth looks like. And, and we've also modeled in what we think would happen to your business, right? That's where you customize it. And that's where you get that strategic, that strategic value. And if you know that there's gonna be um, some day one or year one or year two thing, really magic that will happen, we'll adjust that back into the current financials and say, here's what our year this year would look like if we were with you this year, right? And, and that gets you to this adjusted modeled um, revenue and EBITDA that you're, you're, you're selling the business on, you're telling that story. And so we would customize the SIM um, to strategic buyers in that way. But it's gonna be different based on each buyer. Great. Andy, next question that came in. The process we talked about on the funnel was outreach and indication of interest and then a letter of intent. The question is the following. Once we have the letter of intent, is it binding? What happens after that with due diligence? And within that, then what kind of, once the money happens, is it a wire? How does the money work? And especially as it relates to if there's some sort of holdover. Okay. Typically, once you get LOIs, you evaluate them. And I'm, I'm assuming there's been a competitive process, but whether it's just one or you've got several, um, once you pick the one that is acceptable to you and you sign it, that's now binding. Okay. And typically, you're going to go into a period of exclusivity. Could be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Those, those kind of vary depending. Um, and in that period of exclusivity, and then you close. So typically from the time you have an LOI, closing is very likely to occur within 60 to 90 days. During that 60 to 90 day period, the buyer is doing their final due diligence. If they uh, need um, a lender to help support the deal, they're getting their lender lined up. Um, and then you're also negotiating the purchase agreement and any other agreements, if there's employment agreements, if there's some transition service agreements, all these agreements are being negotiated. Um, and there's a lot of value there to be had, right? In terms of there's different terms in a purchase agreement, such as how working capital is treated, how are, um, is indemnification treated. There's a lot of value um, to be neg negotiated there, but all of that's being negotiated buyer gets through their final due diligence they get their funding set up um, you get the agreements ready to sign you sign and you close unless there's maybe some approvals or some other things that are needed before closing and typically you sign and then there's a period to get the approvals you get the approvals and then you close um, and in most cases from the time you have the LOI it, it's very typical I'd say you could be closed within 60 to 90 days Perfect. Oh, and then the question on, on, on funds transfer. So on that day, your, your business is being sold for a hundred million dollars. You will give, uh, working with the investment banker and your legal team, um, the buyer, a list of where the funds are going to be distributed to. Um, there's a hundred million. And then my, my lawyer's getting this much. The investment banker gets this much. Um, Maybe there's a couple different shareholders. Shareholder A gets this much. Shareholder B gets this much. Shareholder C gives, gets this much. And you give wire instructions for each one of those. And the seller or the buyer then instructs their, uh, where, their, where their funds are coming from, the bank or whoever. Here's, here's where you're wiring these funds to and they all get wired. Um, and, then, and that's got to get double and triple checked with cybersecurity issues today. It's, it's all got to be double and triple check and verbal, um, uh, verbal cl verbally closing the loop the day those wires are going to make sure the wires go to the right spot. 
Hey, Andy, one more quick question, um, given that we're almost up on time here, and this will be our last, and we'll talk about how we follow up here. Um, question from the CEO's perspective regarding their executive team. Do I need to set up some sort of incentive for them in advance, or is that something that the actual buyer has more control of? Can you please concisely answer that in the next two minutes? Yeah, I'd say if, if you have a few key employees uh, and you want to involve them in the process, and many many owners want to give back to their employees anyways, you can set them up with some type of a, a sales bonus structure that, you know, at, at a certain level, they get this, at a different level, get, they get that. So they're motivated to help support the process. Um, and then many times we would, with the, the owner and then also with, you know, on, on uh, us representing, we would represent to the buyer, hey, these are the, this is the key employee management team. These are the people that, that the seller feels is really important to have kept on. And then many times there's employment agreements that, that keep them on. Um, maybe there's a, a stay a stay bonus that the, the buyer would say, I really need these people. And if you stay for a year, you're going to get this. Um, uh, maybe there's a severance that people are so worried. Oh, we just got bought. I'm going to be let go. I got to go find another job because I'm going to lose my job. And many times you'd say, well, let's give them, let, maybe the, the seller or the buyer would say, we'll give them severance. They have protection just in case. It's just a safety net for them. But it, it, it makes them feel more comfortable that I've got a home and if they don't need me, I'm still protected, so I'm willing to stay on and not go out and immediately find another job and just leave. So those are elements of, of that can be done both from the the seller and then also uh, from the buyer side. So you, many times you can get both. Excellent. Hey, Andy, listen, big thank you for sharing your knowledge today. There was a huge interest in so far as attendance, and there's a tons of questions that we could not get to. Um, I want to thank you very much. And for the audience, um, look, there's an overwhelming number of attendees and questions here. If you want to follow up, there's two ways you can follow up. One, at CEO Coaching, happy to have follow-up conversations with any one of our coaches. There should be a link in the chat. Feel free to go ahead and schedule that. And Andy has graciously uh, volunteered to go ahead and answer any follow-up questions you might have as well. His information should be in the uh, chat box as well. But in case it's not Andy, can you go ahead and share that with the uh, audience? Sure. Uh, people can reach out to me on my email. It's A Harris, A H A R R I S, at S T S Capital. Selling to Strategics, helping people achieve success to significance. S T S Capital.com. A Harris at S T S Capital.com. Andy, big thank you from myself and the audience. Appreciate your time and your knowledge. Thank you to the audience. This webinar is now over. Thank you. Thank you.